Two of the most successful bounty hunters in the nation are back. This is real bounty hunting. This is finding someone that doesn't want to be found. In a battle of wits. The last time we had an encounter with him, he got himself buried in a closet, two shotguns loaded. We got to be careful because this kid does know how to hide with guns. The next step is simple, use them. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey. If you don't let me see your hands, I'm going to put a bullet in the back of your head. They do whatever it takes. I have no problem with taking another life if they are intending to take mine. To bring wanted fugitives back to justice. He says he'd rather kill himself than go back to jail this time, huh? Right now. Hands up! Now! Do not do! None of these ever are routine, because routine will get you killed. Hands around! Over the past 30 years, Leonard Padilla has become one of the world's most successful bounty hunters. 32 years. I've been responsible for the uh, capture and incarceration of over 4,000. I quit counting when I reached 4,000, and that was about uh, 15 years ago. Leonard has put his entire life into the business of finding wanted fugitives, but this hasn't come without sacrifice. All that, all that talk about well, When you're in the bounty hunting business, you, uh, you draw a lot of criticism because you neglect a large part of your family life and social life, but it's a situation where you're either going to be a bounty hunter or you're going to be a socialite. Together, the two bounty hunters were responsible for the arrest of thousands of skips in the 90s. Rob has recently forged his own career, which includes working away from Leonard on his own contracts. Today, Leonard and Rob face a full caseload. When someone is arrested, provided it's not a capital offense, they generally have the right to bail out of jail. The most common way is to hire a bail bondsman. If the defendant misses a court date, they become a wanted person. The bail bondsman hires bounty hunters to find and arrest the individual. Bounty hunters are not associated with law enforcement. Nonetheless, they have the right to follow wanted people across state lines, break and enter their homes, and arrest them at any time. In Sacramento, the team begins the search for Tina Chavez, who failed to appear in court and has left her bondsman on the hook for $10,000. Leonard has known Tina and her sister for years. I've helped them sometimes when they were in need, and other times I've had to go put them in jail. I put her sister in jail probably half a dozen times in the past 30 years. It's a situation with people like Tina where they just kind of uh, hope that the judge forgets about their situation, that the judge, uh, the, the file gets lost somewhere, some clerk mislays it, and. And it goes away, and, 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 uh, and, and it's never heard from again. The team heads to Tina's address across the river in West Sacramento. Rob approaches the front door and sends Leonard around back. It appears someone is home. Okay. You got big shoes underneath the coffee table and a purse sitting right on top. By law, bounty hunters have the right to break and enter any residence listed on the defendant's bail application. One of the problems that law enforcement has is their hands are tied so much. I mean, if they didn't personally see the guy with the warrant, they're not going to be able to make entry but we have a little bit more leeway in the fact that, yeah, we can make entry into your house and come get you. And you sign that right away when you bailed out. Hey, Tina, we're here to take you into the jail. We need to open the door. Hey, guys. Tina. Tina. They make entry back there? It's easier to go inside. Tina, you need to come on out. We're gonna have to come in and get you. Come on, let's go. Tina, you need to come on out, honey. I'm gonna open the front door. I'll go with you. Go you inside this way. Huh? On this side. I'll oh, just go in with it. Mm -hmm. We're gonna go in the back window. Roger.
Tina, if you don't let me see your hands, I'm gonna put a bullet in the back of your head because I don't know what you, if you got a gun or not. Let me see your hands. I don't know if you have a gun or not. Why are you hiding down here? I don't want to go to jail. Well, get your hands up there. Put your hands behind your back. Put your hands behind your back till I get you covered. Everything's cool once I know, but I got somebody hiding underneath me. You get a little concerned. Uh, Rob found her under the desk. She's got her handcuffs on, so we'll probably come out the front door. Roger. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Anybody else in this house? No. Tina, do you know that you got a warrant issued for your attorney as well as Ricardo after all the help they gave you? Leonard. Hey, listen, Tina, I told you. I was never told of Why didn't you answer thing? the door right now? Because I knew you guys were coming. Rita told me. No, it's ridiculous. This is ridiculous, isn't it, Tina? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Hey. Uh, anyhow, they'll just... They're just going to give you a new court date anyhow. They are. Well, call Ricardo. He'll get you a new court date. I mean, I was climbing through the window. We couldn't see her at all. She was all the way into the desk. And when I got up on top of the desk, I could see her, the feet sticking out. And so I was a little bit nervous because you don't know whether they're laying there with a gun or what they've got. Is, do you do yoga every day between 10 and 11 under the desk? What do you like to Leonard calls Tina's sister to give her the news. Oh, well, see, she was doing her yoga under the desk. She says she does. The reason she was under the desk is she does yoga every day between 10 and 11 under the desk. Don't worry about it. Don't get all nervous. Did you sign that thing? How am I going to sign? Well, can't you write with your foot? No. Oh, man, you threw my card on. Look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> well, the thing about Tina and her family, I've known them. I mean, they're just they're just people that I know. And I think I'm as comfortable being around them as I am uh, around anybody else because I know them, you know? And they know me. And she reaches up and gives me a kiss while she's handcuffed. <laughs> she says I gave her a kiss. <laughs> I told her I don't care. It doesn't matter. We kissed. <laughs> the next morning, Rob and team member Art Battle set off on their own. They're on their way to Reno, Nevada to assist fellow bounty hunter Doug Lewis, who has a full caseload. It's like 7 in the morning up here in Reno. We came up here early um, so we can get a full day of helping them. In an industry where contacts are key, Rob finds value in lending a hand to other bounty hunters from time to time. The first case involves an individual who missed court almost two months ago. An informant recently agreed to show Doug where the defendant is living. Rob, Art, and Doug follow the informant to the address. He's taking us down there, and uh, he's going to slow down and point the driveway. We already know that it's the second trailer in on the left side of that driveway. The informant signals the bounty hunters by flashing his brake lights as he passes a trailer park. Doug interviews the owner of the trailer who is renting space to the fugitive and his father. We don't want to cause you any trouble. Okay. Okay. But, uh, you know, if he's wanted and you're harboring him, then that's a crime. That's clear. You understand it, right? Well, the guy in the trailer said that our guy doesn't get off work till late in the afternoon. So instead of sitting there where there was just too much activity and not a really good place to sit, we're going to wait down the road and come back in about an hour or two. At 5.30, they revisit the trailer park to see if the fugitive has returned. This time, a woman answers the door. Hello. How you doing? Hi. Oh, I don't know. You don't know? Is he here or not? I don't know who he is. You know who he is? I'm about to leave, I'm a friend. So. Mr. Friend, well, I was going to see if maybe a is in here. Yeah. You were here, here to see his dad. Yeah. You're the dad, aren't you? This guy. You know him? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah? 
It's your son, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah? ¿Dónde? El puerto. ¿Dónde? Ah, no. Trabajo. Trabajo, who's in here? Uh, this is kind of funny. Well, now you pissed me off, dude. Turn around, put your hands behind your back. Turn around, put your hands on your head, now. That's it. Taser, you speak taser? Turn around. Coming up, the team struggles to put the wily fugitive in custody. Behind your back. Manos! Manos! Doug has located the defendant in a small bathroom. Well, you pissed me off, dude. Turn around, put your hands behind your back. Turn around, put your hands on your head, now. That's him. Taser, you speak taser? Turn around, now! Down! Stand up, Don't get down there, stand up. Get the up. There you go. Hook him up. Don't move. All right? You got his arms? Yeah, I got his arms. Here. Put your arms on your back. Take this arm first. This arm here. Put it behind your back. Manos! Manos! Hands around! Right. Right. I got him. You got him? You got him. OK, you got that one on? OK, hold that one for a minute. I got to move. Bring your arm back. Hidden weapons pose a very real threat to bounty hunters when arresting people on their own turf. Art explains that using force is often a necessary part of the job. Rob had the hold of him, but I didn't know what he had maybe, you know, underneath the toilet, you know, in the little closet thing next to the cabinet, and if he had a gun, a knife, anything. Well, in a situation like that, you know, the guy's not complying with Doug and the use of his taser. Um, the area was so confined, obviously our first objective is to get him into a control hold and try to get control of the situation. The taser at that point, even though it's a great tool, it's just, it's hard to be effective in there. I mean, the possibility of injuring him or us is just too great in that small of a confined area. So it's a matter of getting him into a control hold and getting the cuffs on him. He fought the whole time until he was in handcuffs, and he fought all the way to the car, you know, resisting and trying to still do something. At that point, you just got to get him in the car and get out of there. The defendant is booked into Washoe County Jail, where he will await trial or bail out again. As night falls on Reno, the biggest little city in the world, Rob, Art, and Doug move on to their next case, a fugitive who is wanted on multiple charges. The team arrives at the address the fugitive listed on his bail application. Could be his kid. Kids coming to the door, someone on the couch. Oh, we're looking for a He's not here. He's not here? No. What is he at? I don't know. Two females. In that situation, um, the first contact we had was with the, you know, the kids. You know, we're looking for dad. Um, you know, we weren't getting any cooperation. You know, even if they knew they weren't going to tell us, it wasn't going anywhere. Does your uncle know we're? Uh... No. No. Did he go back to Mexico or what? No, I don't know. No, no. You haven't heard, seen or heard from him. Okay. And uh, he's trying to get your mom on the phone now. Yeah. Where's your mom working at now? Uh, we kind of got lucky that mom, who was wife and co-signer, shows up. Hey, mom, call me when she gets home. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's my mom. Yeah. The fugitive's wife insists that she does not know where her husband is living. Doug explains the gravity of her situation as a co-signer on the bail bond. Yes. You bailed him out of jail, okay? You signed on the bail bond. You are responsible for him not yeah. being Yeah, yeah, and you know, I... One of the great things about Nevada is that defendant and co-signer signed a general power of attorney. So basically, at the time of forfeiture, to recoup the loss, I mean, the potential to take just about anything is there. Um, I've seen people lose their houses, their cars, their businesses, just because they were trying to cover up and not, you know, give up where the guy was. I would suggest you start spending some time locating. All right. I 
I don't think that if you keep looking for him, that you're not going to be able to find him. In fact, I think that you probably got a pretty good idea where he's at. Doug informs the fugitive's wife that if she doesn't surrender the keys, he will call a tow truck. You're not going to give up the keys? Fine. Despite losing her car, the wife stays silent. Well, it sucks that, you know, apparently she's just not going to help us. You know, she's, she would rather, you know, face losing her car and everything else than to put up with what might be coming from him if she did give up his location. Hours later, a call comes in which points the bounty hunters to an apartment complex where the fugitive might be living. Rob worries that the fugitive's family will notify him before they get there. Well, you know, there, there was a lot of conversation between her and the kids back and forth. You know, the kids, you know, obviously it's her dad. They kind of don't want to give him up. Right now, we just have to race to the location of where the defendant is before he might get tipped off by the kids. They arrive, but no one is home. The team reluctantly retreats for the night, hoping that the suspect hasn't already been tipped off to the hunt. It's about one o'clock. Uh, got a couple good leads on the one that we can pick back up in the morning, so we're just gonna get some sleep and start over tomorrow morning early. Coming up, back in Sacramento, Leonard faces down a man with a haunting past. The last time we had an encounter with him, back in October, he got himself buried in a closet, two shotguns, loaded one of them, and a 40 caliber, full, fully loaded. Yeah, go ahead. While Rob continues to work the streets of Reno, Leonard has a case that he wants the whole team involved in back home. This is a situation where we have to go out and pick up the girlfriend of a guy that uh, was involved in burglarizing uh, uh, my office back in October. I'm concerned about it enough to wait for Rob and the other guys to all get together to where we can take the full team out there instead of just one or two people going out and knocking on the door. At first light, the team in Reno makes another visit to the apartment complex. According to Doug, who is already standing by on scene, it appears the fugitive may be moving at this very moment. Right back to the apartment, there is a Hispanic male with a pickup backed up to the front door pretty much moving out as we speak. It's not now a case of where he's home in bed sleeping and we're going to come get him after a hard night of gambling. It's, hey, you guys are coming. I'm going to get the heck out of here. So yeah, is he prepared now to shoot it out or fight with us or whatever? Yeah, that's all going through your mind at that point. Rob and Art rush in to assist Doug. Wait, what's your last name? What's your last name? Turn around. Honey. Stand on your knees, you're under arrest. Feel the pure court. Once inside the residence, Art realizes that they made it there just in time. You think he was getting ready to go? Oh, okay. definitely. There's no furniture. He's losing The team finds what they believe to be stolen merchandise, along with an assortment of weapons, drugs, and paraphernalia. This is a crack pipe, man. Smoking mess. They're gonna bring units here because we can't secure all this crap anyway. There's too much contraband for the bounty hunters to handle themselves. They call law enforcement. Anytime a, a situation becomes a public safety issue, you know, we have to get law enforcement involved, notify them, and let them do their job on that part. Our basic job is just as simple as, you know, the guy signed a contract to go to court, he failed to appear didn't go to court, and now we have to go pick him up and put him in jail. And that's all we're there for. We're not there to give him new cases, make a fresh arrest. I mean, we're not law enforcement. We're there to pick him up and take him to jail. The police arrive and notify the bounty hunters that the fugitive is wanted for a far worse crime than they had been aware. So we decided to go ahead and let the PD come secure this place and do whatever they wanted. When they get here, they advise us that he's a suspect in a shooting five days ago that he's wanted on five more warrants out of other counties that we didn't know about, as well as the shooting that happened last week. Rob is elated, but also relieved that the arrest went down as well as it did. It feels great to get somebody off the street that's like that. I mean, you know, PD is looking for him. This guy said he's been looking for him ever since the shooting. Obviously, he's dangerous, so he's now in custody. 
know, but there again, it just goes to show that, you know, sometimes we don't know what we're grabbing at the same time. You know, we always got to be careful. Every single person can be a danger. Before he leaves Reno, Rob has a chance to reflect on the week away from his former mentor. Rob spent seven years in the 90s learning Leonard's approach. Being away from Leonard is, is you know, good and bad. I mean, when you're in the heat of the moment with Leonard and you're right on the guy's trail and you're, you know, we're both doing things to resolve the situation, I mean, you know, yeah, that's great. I mean, there's nothing better than that. Being away from him is just is just a difference. You know, I'm on my own, I'm doing different things, and, and I'm just catching people the way I catch them. I know that I can accomplish great bounty hunting without having to work 24-7 like he does. He learned a tremendous amount from the man known as the godfather of bail, but eventually he couldn't take Leonard's 24-7 mentality, and in 2002, broke ties with him completely. When we were working together originally, I mean, he was putting me through the hoops, and I think that was good. I mean, he was seeing what kind of guy I was and pushing me to my limits, and, you know, there came a point where I was just like, I just want to be done. I want to, I want to do my own thing. I don't want to have somebody telling me every five minutes, you know, whether I can take a breath or not. Their current relationship is marked by a new agreement that takes into account their very different work philosophies. The new arrangement is probably going to be better for all of us involved. It gives, uh, it gives Rob a lot of latitude, and uh, the understanding is uh, I have to say, okay, fine, if that's what he wants to be involved in, I have no problem with it. But Leonard believes in time, Rob won't be able to deny his true calling and will begin making the same sacrifices he's made in his own career, including working around the clock. Rob's going to go through a few years of uh, dealing with bounty hunting as a job, dealing with bounty hunting as a, okay, I got to go do this with my family and all that. But he'll come around someday and say, I can get so much more done if I don't go to the, you know, the family function this Thanksgiving or if I skip Christmas and catch a fugitive. Because the fugitives that you're looking for, the tough ones, they let their guard down during the holidays. And those are the things that are most important for a guy that says, yeah, family's important. I got to be there for Christmas. I got to be there for Thanksgiving. Uh, well, it's the same thing for a fugitive. Family's important to a fugitive, too. So if the fugitive's at Christmas at his family's, you might want to give up your family and be at his family's. Rob and Art rush back to Sacramento in time to assist Leonard with a pressing case. Leonard explains the personal history he has with this particular defendant's boyfriend. They're part of a loose-knit uh, group of burglars that have been burglarizing houses and businesses in Sacramento to the extent that they actually burglarized or were part of a group of people that burglarized my office back on October 29th. The burglars stole Leonard's guns, knives, and commemorative poker chips. He recovered the guns and knives days later, but the poker chips are still at large. Leonard warns the crew about his last encounter with the boyfriend. Billy himself, the last time we had an encounter with him back in October, he got himself buried in a closet Two shotguns, loaded one of them, and a 40 caliber, full, fully loaded. Now, I don't know whether he'd have used it or not. Kevin grabbed one of his buddies and used the guy for a shield and talked him out. So in that regard, in that regard, we got to be careful because this kid does know how to hide with guns. The next step is simple, use them. Leonard's also not taking any chances on this I've, one. I've, I've had people that uh, say, well, you've created this aura of invincibility around you, and you think that a bulletproof vest will, uh, will make it crumble or, or chip away at it. Yeah, that could be. I don't want anybody to think that I'm standing there in front of them and I'm afraid to if I didn't wear a bulletproof vest. Today, he wears a bulletproof vest for one of the first times in his lengthy career. That's okay, I don't care about the back. Why is your vest in going then? Because I got a fat belly. Go ahead. It's gonna reach? Yeah, yeah, it'll reach. Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm always scared. No, I'm always scared. When when there's a situation where you know that the individual has held a gun or knows about guns, or you're going into a home 
and you're, you know, uh, I, uh, Rob says he goes through a door hoping he doesn't have to kill somebody on the other side. I go through the door hoping somebody doesn't start shooting, and if they do, that I at least get off a couple of rounds. That's my thinking. The team has little more than a description of the suspect's vehicle and a general idea of her neighborhood. Their only option is to canvas the area street by street and hope that a solid lead presents itself. We're going to go out here to the street. Uh, we don't have exact numbers on the street, so we're going to be looking for the car that she's supposed to have, which is apparently a red Saturn. So the street's a pretty small street, not a whole lot of houses on it. And uh, see if we can find this red Saturn. Rob combs the streets. Leonard and the crew check out an apartment complex where they believe the defendant is staying. Leonard is determined to put an end to this case. It does take on a, uh, on a personal note, not vengeance. It's still work. It's still getting paid to do it. But it's a situation where you definitely have to get out there and get the job done, specifically to send home uh, a message. And that is, you're not going to burglarize me, and you're not going to jump bail on one of the agencies I work for. I didn't really uh, appreciate or, or take kindly to that because you just can't be the world famous bounty hunter and being burglarized and not doing something about it. So it is personal in that regard. I tell you guys on the street, I work during the day and I'm here at night and I don't normally see, but if they're here, she'll be able to take Okay, sure. Thank you much. Mm -hmm. The maintenance man points the team to the apartment manager and she has good news. Yes, he's one of my tenants. How about his... He lives in 2047. 2047? Yes. No, it's not oh. 2046. This guy 2047. Lives. I'll show you. Hello. Coming up, it's payback time for Leonard and the crew. Open the door. Open the door, Billy. The team pinpoints the apartment and they move in. I just want somebody over there. Open the door. Open the door, Billy. It's us again, Billy. Okay, okay. Uncle, Uncle. Oh. Yeah. She's in there. Okay. Now, you know you got a warrant. I uh, know. Yeah, you got one. Okay, now, you're none of our business. She's the one that's on our bond. Okay. You're okay. We're going to leave you here with a baby. Okay. Well, he probably thought I was coming to kill his ass for having ripped off my office. But that wasn't it. It was just because his woman didn't go to court. My job is to put fugitives back in jail. That's what I get paid for, and I jumped at that opportunity. You got car? No. OK. Billy? If you want to ride down there, I'll get that warrant pulled. That's my whole thing. Whatever he thought, well, if it tormented him a little, that's, that's frosting on the cake. But my job was I get paid to put her in jail. It took me a, less than a day to find her, put her in jail. Yeah, that's all I do. That's what I do, and that's what I did. Billy, come take the baby. Take the baby. Take the baby. Yeah, leave the baby here. Billy, take the baby. Nothing at all. Uh, you got no guns in here, Billy? Yes, sir. Not since I got mine back, huh? <laughs> With Billy Black, when you go into his apartment to, to arrest his girlfriend, and he, there, there's a brand new baby, and all of a sudden, you, you, get, you get to considering the baby's future. So maybe if you lend a hand to this individual, maybe helping him get a job or something like that will change that child's future. But the odds are stacked up against a little kid like that. Helping him get a job or something like that will change that child's future. Billy is unemployed and for the moment, a single parent. Leonard tells him he may be able to find him a job. Uh, oh, wait, no, he didn't well, I'm, I'm not doing you a favor. I mean, I'm doing it for your kid. You know? I know you are. You're too many. No, no, I'm not. Yeah, you are. Uh, in my eyes, you are. I'm just steady. <laughs> get my chips back. <laughs> The next day, Billy comes by the office for a visit. When we picked up my I asked Billy to come in because he had a misdemeanor that was citable, and I told him I'd help him get it cited. 
And I also told him, because he's got a cute little girl and all that, and so I told him, I said, that I will get him a job. And uh, uh, I'm going to talk to him later on in the week or tomorrow and find out exactly what he's able to do. I'm definitely going to hook him up with a job, that's for sure. I think he's, he's showing me a little bit uh, of what I need to know about what, what encompasses being a, a man and, a, and an adult. And, and I've seen what it is like on the bad side of, uh, of life. And um, he represents what uh, I would think a man on, uh, on the straight and narrow or on the good side of life would be. Good luck to you. Call me tomorrow afternoon. I will. I'll see if I have something for you by then. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care of the baby. I will. You baptized her yet? No. I'm going to put him for Godfather. <laughs> we, we were shopping for a Godfather. You got one. I think you just made it. Okay. This isn't the first time in Leonard's career that he's lent a helping hand to someone who has tried to harm him. There was some people that tried to kill him back in the 80s, 26 years ago. And uh, as they started getting out of prison, they, the only guy that they could turn to for help getting a job or, or co-signing on a vehicle or, or borrowing some money uh, was myself. I mean, eventually, uh, they all came around at one time or another, and there was half a dozen of them involved in that plot. And at one time or another, they all came around, and they all said, hey, can you give me a hand? Can you help me out here? Can you help me get a car or whatever it was? I got no problem with it. You know, it's just something they did. I'm just glad they failed. I'm glad they weren't successful. And I guess for that reason, uh, I don't mind helping them out. Because obviously, if they'd have been successful, I wouldn't have been around to help. Rob heads back to Reno to assist Doug with one more capture. Lucas Brady is a fugitive who has been involved with the judicial system since he was 13 years old. He uh, has a significant uh, past criminal history. He's got convictions for drug trafficking, uh, weapons violations, and he pretty well covers the, uh, the gamut of things that you can do and be a bad boy. Doug and Rob head out and begin the search at the fugitive's mother's home. Well, we're about a block and a half away. This is supposed to be the defendant's mom's house, which is his address of record. We're looking for Lucas. Where's he at? OK, when's the last time he was here? Two days ago? Two days ago? He got in a fight with Two days ago, he got in a fight with During the house. OK, where does he normally stay when he gets in a fight? We got some information that possibly he was uh, pretty abusive to uh, the girlfriend, which is his son's mother, a couple days ago. And, uh, see if we can locate her and maybe uh, get a little more idea where he might be or where he's hanging out at. But, uh, he apparently doesn't get along real well with anybody in his family. Violence seems to be uh, pretty much, you know, his end game. Whenever he doesn't want to deal with something, he breaks things, throws things, uh, gets into fights with people, that kind of deal. And he's made some statements over the last made some statements over the last couple days that uh, he'd rather just kill himself or be killed than uh, go back into custody. So, you know, whether that's his heartfelt feelings and the drugs talking really didn't make any difference because at this point that seems to be where his state of mind's at. Our job is to mainly solve the, the problem, you know? I mean, obviously, you're talking about people that, that have a problem to begin with. You know, they miss court, they're running. Um, a lot of them have been, you know, they're at their wit's end on what they're gonna do. I mean, they know that when they get caught, they're gonna do some serious time. So they're probably, in their mindset, thinking about even taking a life if it has to, just to not do that time. I mean, obviously, if we can point out that, you know, hey, guy, you know, you're gonna do a couple years. You gotta, you gotta get it done. You know, this is what you did. Now you're gonna do it by running and taking someone else's life. You're just gonna put yourself away forever. You know, so if we can diffuse the situation, that's the best. But we have to do what we have to do to solve the problem. Coming up, the team struggles to put the fugitive in custody. Right now, hands up now. Do not move. In the hunt for fugitive Lucas Brady, the stakes have just been raised. I made some statements over the last couple days that uh, he'd rather just kill himself or be killed than uh, go back into custody. Rob and Doug leave the fugitive's mother's house and move on to the next location, his ex-girlfriend's house. 
Now, he just slashed the daughter's tires here, so they should be pissed at him, but this is the lady that bailed him. Yeah. Doug goes to the front door. Rob covers the back. Yeah, it's negative. I'm getting no response. Looks like the security door is dead bolted up here. Oh, we got somebody coming home right now. Wait, wait, don't wake him up yet. Let me find out who this guy is here. Adi, looking for Lucas. The ex-girlfriend's father says that Lucas has not been there for some time. Uh, Doug doubts the man is being 100% honest. I think that uh, there was a long-standing relationship and a child in common between his daughter and the defendant, and that probably made the defendant family. And uh, you have to understand that blood's thicker than water. And uh, you know he was under absolutely no obligation to tell us anything, let alone the truth. So. Uh, yeah, he was probably a little less than forthcoming. Thank you, sir. Despite their inability to locate Lucas at this point, Doug remains confident that they will catch up with him. There's good news and bad news. You know, the, the bad news is that we don't have him in custody yet, but the good news is, is that he's still running around the circles and he hasn't decided to run in straight lines. Right. Well, from what we've learned so far today, Lucas is probably one of the more dangerous ones that we're dealing with right now. It appears that he could be in that mindset of he doesn't really care, you know? The one lady we talked to made comment that he, he had said yesterday that he'd rather die than go to jail. So, I mean, that could lead to a pretty heavy confrontation if pushed into a corner. You're dealing with a guy that may want to force a suicide situation, you know, or force a, one of us to take his life, and that may be the ultimate result. But it's going to be on his choice, not mine. Hours later, the bounty hunters returned to the house. Well, we're a couple blocks away from where we were earlier today. Um, you know, we went there once, and he fed us a line that, you know, we he hadn't seen him in a long time. But just because we go there one time doesn't mean that we won't come back and continue to come back until we catch him. Rob sees someone move across a window. Someone's in the kitchen right now. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, I just banged on the front door and it popped open. It's imperative that the bounty hunters determine if the fugitive is inside the house before making entry. Hello! Safety right now is the number one concern because it's so dark out here. And, you know, I know I saw someone in that window. And now, obviously, by us not being able to see him, he doesn't want us to see him. So where he went, where he might pop up is quite a danger at this point. 10-4. I banged on the door. It looked like it was a jar. And uh, the thing popped open. It's standing open about six inches right now. I can see in the living room. I've been yelling inside. Nobody's responding. Yeah, I can hear you all the way to the back. Bill enforcement! Come on to the front door here! Yeah, you see any movement at all? I can hear a TV or something going on in here. Okay, there's nobody in the kitchen that I can see. The dryer's going in the garage. But definitely I saw movement between me and the light inside the house. At the point where you're positive, you know, 100% sure that he's there, I mean, it's all rolls off. I mean, you can break and enter and, and actually take him into custody. But getting to that point is the cautious step. So we have to be 100% sure. We have to try to see if there's anybody else in the house. 10-4, and you saw, you're definitely sure that you saw an individual inside? I definitely saw what looked like a large person walk by in the shadows. They were walking from point A to point B, and then he started knocking, and they've never come out since then. 
10 4, and we're just about absolutely positive there was somebody in there casting a shadow when they moved, correct? This back bedroom's clear, and the uh, front room. I mean, I can see down the hall. I mean, what do you think on entry? I mean, I'll make entry if you want to take this back. It's clear that Lucas is, in fact, hiding in the house. They just don't know where. Well, at this point, I mean, I know I saw someone in that window, so I know there's someone in that house. And at this point, it's obvious they don't want to be seen or be found. It's a big game of hide and seek. So it's either our guy or, you know, we walked in on a burglary in progress or something. But either way, we're going to go in and find out who's in here, and someone's going to go to jail. Be in here, make yourself seen. Put your hands behind your back one at a time. You got weapons on you right now? What? OK. All right. You, all right, I've got him. You got him? You got a taser on the back of your head, pal. OK, I ain't doing that man. OK, right hand behind your back. I'm not watching my hands. Right, right hand behind your back. When we walked in, he was sitting there on the floor of the kitchen. I mean, he was just looking down. He had a look like, you know, I can't believe you actually came in. I mean, he would have sat there motionless all night long into the next day and probably next week. You know, thinking that we wouldn't come in. And when we came in there, it was just a, it didn't move. It was just a thing of, wow, they actually came in and got me. Come on, Lucas. The job is done, and Lucas Brady will return to jail, a set of circumstances he has come to know all too well. He has spent much of his adult life in and out of jail. It's been my whole life. How old are you now? 27. How long have you been in trouble? Since I was 13. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I ain't been out for Christmas for like 10 years. with myself getting back in the same stupid situation when I could have just kept doing doing things right could have been able to get my son in Lucas's final words are meant for his family I love him and I don't mean to be this way and I wish I was a better father and I'm sorry things turned out this way well, here's a guy that we heard he's gonna go out with a fight and, you know take his own life or have somebody else take his life and Hey, you know, it's always good if it doesn't work out that way. The week in Reno, apart from Leonard, has been a relief for Rob. Hey, the break from Leonard is always good. Even though the hours were long and hard up here, um, you know, I mean, Leonard's, Leonard's Leonard, you know, and a good day away from him is a good day. <laughs> I think Leonard's at a point in his life where I mean, he's done just about everything, you know? I mean, he has succeeded in all his captures. He's, you know, he's at that point where he doesn't have to get one more to prove what a success he is. And so I think he's comfortable, you know? He's in a really good part of his life. But Leonard feels there's one more elusive fugitive he'd like to catch. I wish that President Bush would see some talent in me and let me go over to Afghanistan and see if maybe, just maybe, with a couple people, I could come up with some ideas on picking up bin Laden. He's just another guy that's hiding. And he's easier to find because he got a whole lot of people that know where he's at. People we're looking for sometimes only have one or two people that know where they're at. He's got hundreds, if not thousands, of people that know where he's at. There's no such thing as a high-end uh, individual running versus a low-end individual running. Running is running. Uh, even if a guy's got all the money in the world, that he has access to. He's still running. He still has people that know where he's at, and he still has people chasing him. Uh, I've always said the hardest person in the world to find is the guy who just stays home and doesn't go anywhere. And the godfather of Bale is confident that he could find the world's most wanted fugitive. You think you could find it, Lonnie? Yeah. 